Morning. Warm weather, adequate moisture, and plenty of sunshine pretty much means that this crop is nearly changing by the day. It seems like every time you blink your eyes, there's more and more foliage appearing. The only thing not improving is Dad's crooked corn planting job. That one may take a while to sort itself out. We'll give him a little bit of slack. He is approaching elderly status. I shouldn't pick on Dad right now. He's two days removed from his rotator cuff rebuild surgery. One of two. Both shoulders are bad. He's going to have to do the other one after harvest. Went okay, I guess. I think they said that there was a lot more repair work needed than they were expecting. I guess life on the farm adds up pretty quickly on poor little shoulders. I'm gonna run inside, give and get a morning update for him, offer him a ride to John Deere somewhere if he wants to get out of the house. He hasn't exactly left his cave much since the surgery. He just kind of wants to keep as minimal amount of stress and fatigue on the shoulder while it's healing. And then once he's clear, he'll probably start driving around again. A few days ago while dad was under the knife, Chris, Jeff, and I were busy destroying our own shoulders, sweeping out that shivers bin. They've since moved on to that north bean bin. Once that's empty, we'll be done hauling corn out of the main farm. Other than tackling some odds and ends yesterday, I spent the majority of my day going around scouting fields, trying to see what's dry enough for Helena's custom 32 bars to go across on us. We're gonna go ahead and try and push as many acres through. There's a little bit of rain in the forecast, so we'd like to get that 32 in the ground. That way a nice rain can help incorporate it. There's a nice looking field of corn. Based on the way that ground looks, I'd say it's ready to get side dressed today. There's Helena running on an 80 acre field about a mile and a half to two miles southwest of our main farm. It was arguably the driest looking field we had yesterday. I've been sitting out here spectating for the last hour or so while Helena and their custom bar work out all the kinks. Needless to say, the first day in fields of side dressing for them is about like the first day of planting for me. There's a lot of adjustments to be made, make sure everything goes okay. It looks like he's ready to fill right now. They also have a handful of bars they keep at the actual store. They do let customers come and get bars if they want to run their own nitrogen. There's different pricing structure depending on how you go about it. Some people like us have it all custom done. Other people have it custom done with Helena. Other people use their tractor and one of Helena's extra bars. And then there's another subset of people who have their entire side dressing setup. They've got a tractor, their own 32 bar, and they just pick up nitrogen from Helena. The soil conditions are a little bit marginal, soft in spots. So we've asked them not to overload these 32 bars too heavy. If you put a ton of product in those tanks, you're putting a lot of weight there behind. So we asked them to maybe keep it easy until the ground gets a little bit drier. Once they get all the hiccups out, they should move pretty quickly. I know it continuously perplexes a lot of you how we have a lot of stuff custom done on our farm. We pay retailers to do the work for us. Obviously with the addition of our own sprayer, we've taken a pretty large chunk of that back into our own hands but we still do have a few things done like fertilizer spreading and hydrous application and this 32% liquid nitrogen side dressing. I will not argue at all that there is money to be saved across the board by doing some of this stuff on your own. The issue that we have on our farm with a lot of these custom jobs is that I'm about the only person who's ambitious and wanting to take on a lot of that to make us more competitive from a financial aspect. My dad and his uncles are all in their 60s. They've worked hard their whole lives. They don't personally see it being worth their time to buy a side dress bar and do all this work themselves because to them, they're happy just saving a few less dollars an acre and letting someone else deal with the headache. You can mark my words though, in the near future, and I don't know how short term we're talking, maybe next year, maybe next couple years, I would like to add the side dressing to my portfolio. I've been kicking around the idea of adjusting our nitrogen plan as a whole, maybe getting a set of Y drops or knock off Y drops for my sprayer and coming in a little bit later post emergence and putting nitrogen right on the top. That's something I'm not really gonna go into too much today, but it is in the works. With the exception of the few fields where I sprayed on 70 pounds of liquid nitrogen earlier this spring, everything on our farm has about 120 pounds, give or take, of actual in applied through fall anhydrous. This side dress pass of nitrogen is basically just a way of splitting up our nitrogen application so we don't lose it all if it's all on in the fall. This in-season pass of nitrogen is commonly referred to just as side dressing. You can use anhydrous ammonia to do it. A lot of people are moving to the 32% liquid nitrogen. 
It's not as potent in terms of nitrogen concentration, but it's also just a liquid. It's not gaseous like anhydrous. It's not even as close to as dangerous. You don't have to pull the pressurized tanks through the field, hook and unhook them on the ends. It's literally like filling a sprayer, put the product in the tank, throw her in the ground. I talked a lot about the price of nitrogen and fertilizers last fall when we we're putting our anhydrous on. I'm not going to talk about that too much. I'm going to focus more on the agronomic aspects today. I will say that 32% is usually about 10 cents more per pound of actual in, so it is a more expensive product. To put it simply, that's kind of just the price you pay for the simplicity of that liquid nitrogen product. On this second pass of nitrogen in crop on almost all of our acres, we're targeting 120 pounds of actual in with 32% nitrogen being about 3.4 pounds per gallon, puts us right over 35 gallons an acre. So that's how much they're knifing in. Disregard some of the winter annuals you see popping up out here. Our herbicide program probably could use some improvement. That may be part of our adjustment moving forward is putting something down pre with some nitrogen. That way it stays clean and we can come back later to clean it up with our Acuron GT. Typically not agronomically sound to put your corn out without a residual product up front to hold back weeds. Regardless, you can see this is a pretty simple setup. Just running a coulter with a knife behind it that dribbles out the 32 in the trench. Nothing too complicated, no closers behind it. It should pretty much seal itself up behind. It really does not amount to that much liquid next to each corn plant. I dug a little bit in the ground here. Every row is different. It's not like a planter where it's super consistent across the board. I think they're targeting anywhere from two to four inches in the ground. You can barely even tell that they put product down there just because it's really not that concentrated at the end of the day when you consider how much nitrogen you need per row per acre. As you can tell, he's been going fairly slow through the field. It is the first day out, obviously. There's a little bit of adjustment getting used to operating, but the main reason is that other than our corn rows being fairly crooked in spots, our corn is also still relatively small. The faster you go, the more dirt and clods you throw up out of the trench from that big knife. It's not really an issue when the corn's larger because it won't affect it. These small corn plants though, that are only V2, maybe pushing V3, really do not enjoy getting a big clod thrown over them. You can end up losing a plant if it pins it down and it's not able to regrow. So we told them to slow down a little bit, they don't have a ton of acres ready to go across Coles County and the greater area where they operate. So they're starting on us, they're going slow. If this corn was another six inches tall, they could literally drive through this as fast as they could pull that bar and stay between the corn rows. Because it's small, they gotta be a little bit more cautious. The only other thing I'd really highlight is that ground conditions are actually pretty great. I'm surprised at how mellow this is right now. It's almost a powder out here. This wasn't planted, you could come plant it today. I'm sure some of you are concerned about the logistics of them side dressing and turning on the ends and running over corn. That is the one nice thing about sending them this early. This corn is so small that unless this tire pins it down in the mud, it'll actually probably come back out. So chemically speaking, you probably want to delay your 32 side dress for as long as possible because you don't want your nitrogen sitting out and facing the environment, volatilization and leaching, all the factors that can reduce your amount in the ground. At the same time, the earlier you send them, the more that the corn can recover from the damage of the side dress bar. Red tractor run to the southwest, green tractor running up here closer to the farm. I'm sorry I had to disappear on you there for a couple of days with dad being out of commission for the next four to 12 weeks, depending on how fast his recovery is. There's been a little transition of responsibilities. I've had to float around, do a lot of things like keep an eye on the side dress bar, help Chris and Jeff empty out a soybean bin. Much like my dad would normally be, I am both on the operational decision-making side of the farming equation, and at the same time, my youth puts me into the labor perspective. If anything, I'm the most physically capable person we have on this farm, and that's not tooting my own horn, it's just pretty easy math when everyone else is 60 plus years old. So when there's something that needs done that requires a little bit of extra ump, I have to come help. Getting that soybean bin empty was a priority enough for me to unhook the tanker. I've got my grain trailer on right now. We knocked that out over a couple of days, though we did have a little bit of an issue with the bin. Jeff and I are headed south to TG and Yoga with the last two loads of beans out of this 25,000, give or take a few thousand bushel bed. 
this bean bin that we've worked on for the last handful of days is actually the first grain we've hauled down to TGM and Yoga since maybe last fall, if not last winter. If you guys could smell through the camera what those wet beans down there smell like, you would stay far, far away from this place. Just the cost of doing business, but man, once those get wet and rotten, they are not good to smell. Rumor has it that the crew at TGM is listening to their farmers, and they bought a bunch of ground around here. They're going to be putting up two more 750,000 bushel bins, as well as a new high-speed grain lane. That way they can pump trucks in faster and faster. It rained a little bit overnight, if you couldn't tell. Anywhere from a half inch to an inch and a half, depending on where you are. Pretty much our farm and then southwest is where the heavier rain are at. Still not enough to really be an issue other than having to wait a few days on side dressing. Ready? Yep. Whoa. Go a little more. You're pa way past it. Whoa, whoa. Wait till we got the truck out. Set up and ready to haul some corn over west. Dad's idea of taking it easy and the doctor's idea are probably two different things. But it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. At the beginning of last week, there was really nothing pressing about getting started on this north bin here at the main farm, other than it just being our last one here when working up in a row to the north, we might as well empty this one. Jeff was hauling solo with just his truck. Once he got about halfway down to two thirds of the way down, he realized that we had a slight issue developing that there were pockets in this bin starting to go slightly off grade. Because it's empty now, you can't really tell that there was ever an issue with this bin, other than looking at a few spots on the wall where the grain was starting to hang up because it started to rot slightly. When you're starting to approach late spring and early summer and you realize you have areas of a bin going off grade, you really prioritize getting them emptied out. Other than keeping an eye on the side dress bar here and there, making sure they knew where they were going and what fields were ready to run, I helped Jeff get the rest of these beans out because it was definitely high up on the list. Once the proper conditions exist in a grain bin, usually temperature and moisture to allow advancement of some of this biological activity that reduces the quality of your grain, it can actually go against you pretty quickly. We checked this bin four weeks ago and it was in perfectly good shape. Just within the last two to three weeks, it must have gotten pretty sour. Most of it was fine. The last few loads we hauled out had about 2% damage, which is not ideal. The really concerning part was that the moisture of the bin, once we got down to the bottom third, was pushing 14.5 to 15%. For those of you who don't know, 14 to 15% moisture on beans in the bin, especially in late spring or early summer, is not good. You can keep corn at 14 or 15% moisture for a very long time, as long as it doesn't get warm inside. Beans though, if they're not around 13 to 13.5%, you need to get them out before they warm up and we made that mistake. My dad is the grain storage master here. He's in charge of running the fans in the fall and the winter. I'm not really sure how they got so wet. Maybe they had a slightly higher moisture than we realized when we put them in or we could have ran the fan on a bad day. If it's high humidity outside and you run the fans, you can actually put moisture back into the bin, which is not good. Usually you want your bins as dry as possible. I, for one, have two theories as to why this soybean bin could have gone off grade kind of in the middle to lower half of it. The first one is that around that time period, early harvest, we did cut a field of beans that was a tad bit wet. There was a lot of green pods in there. We could have put a lot of moisture in the bin, meaning that we created an area where we just did not put enough air through throughout the season to keep them into good quality. Keep in mind that we did core this bin down last January or February, which should extend the lifespan or the quality time of the grain in the bin, but obviously that was not enough. The other thing that I think could have happened is that we had our combine rebuilt last winter, so after last fall, when it was in the shop, they realized that the sieve on the combine was almost completely shot, meaning that throughout the season, it was putting out a very dirty sample of beans. It was letting a lot of small finds and foreign material through to the grain tank and ultimately ending up in our bins. That foreign material is one, high in moisture, and two, very good at blocking airflow from your fans. If you get a lot of that layered around in the bin, even with the spreader, it can cause layers where the air is not getting through, meaning you're ultimately not getting the moisture out of the bin, 
and at the end of the day it starts to warm up here in the spring into summer and it goes off quality pretty quickly regardless we got it taken care of it was not very much at all very minimal i've seen pictures and videos before of where people have let grain bins specifically soybeans get away from them and they almost needed a jackhammer in there to get the beans out these were fine just a few percent here and there that weren't in great shape no big deal they're gone don't have to worry about it on to more corn i wasn't really planning on hooking the grain trailer up at all but that bin was pressing enough that i called an emergency audible and unhooked the tanker. I don't know if I'm gonna help Jeff Hall over west. I was planning on spraying at the beginning of this week. This rain though is gonna push me back for another few days, so I may go ahead and help him haul some corn. I do have a fun little project on the tanker I've been working on. I meant to get this done before our first round of herbicides. I just ran out of time. I've installed this five gallon water tank. I'm going to plumb it to be a little hand rinse tank. So I'm gonna work on that really quickly while Chris and Jeff take a lunch break. Basically, you just put clean water in this and if you spill some herbicide or chemical on your gloves when you're filling, you run over here, you flip the valve I'm gonna install. Not doing a very good job with my Teflon here. Probably don't even need this, but might as well put it on. Good old PTFE, the forever chemical. In case you're wondering why I have two couplers here, I accidentally got the wrong size piping. As opposed to returning it and getting the right size, I just bought a reducer to make it work. That should be all the Teflon we need to run. The rest of it I'll have to use actual pipe glue on. Good way to lose a finger. Just need a pipe wrench to get that open? Yeah, I guess you do. And it's all over my hands now. Nice. Jeff and Chris just showed back up. They're gonna head over west and start hauling corn out of those bins. They have been cored, so we're not really worried about quality over there. Although I guess I should say that we weren't worried about quality here either, and look what happened. Other than allowing the pipe cement to cure a little bit and putting some water in to test it out, this little hand rinse system is done. There's nothing fancy at all going on here. I was a tad bit liberal with the PVC cement. I probably shouldn't have used as much. Technically, the valve probably ought to be right out the bottom of the tank. It's not a big deal if the pipe breaks off and you lose all of your hand water. If your pipe breaks off and you lose all of your solution in the tanker trailer, well, that'd be a completely different nightmare. Either way, it doesn't look like it was engineered by NASA. It does look like it'll do, though. Another couple tenths of an inch this morning. Nice, pleasant shower. This guy's got some twin row beans, and they look great. It's hard not for everything to look great with how good our growing conditions have been so far. We get a little shower, the sun pops up, couldn't look any better. It's always amazing to see the diversity from year to year. Today is May 16th. Sometimes we're not even done planning the first time by this point in the year. Other times we're way ahead of schedule. We're already thinking about spraying corn, side dressing, spraying beans again. Every season just is so different. I, for one, prefer growing seasons that are ahead of schedule because typically so long as the sun keeps shining and the rains keep falling in a timely manner, that means that your yields at the end should be better. That's not an exact science by any means, but it usually ends up that way. Some of our cornfields are getting a little bit hairy. Field cultivators didn't get a complete kill on some of this yellow top out here. Some grass is creeping in and small broadleaf starting to pop through. I really just need the sun to break through for a day or two, dry off the topsoil, and I think in two real hard days of running, I can have all of our corn sprayed. I definitely could have had at least half of our corn ground sprayed by now if I'd started at the beginning of last week. I didn't want to play my hands so soon, so to speak. I'm not necessarily regretting it yet. Looks like the forecast does clear up after this last shower, so we should get a chance here in the next few days to lay that all down, burn back any weeds in our cornfields that have emerged, and put a residual down with that Acuron GT that should last us for the remainder of the growing season. That is the logistical gamble you take in the late spring when you decide when to side dress or spray. If you postpone application because you're waiting on the crops to get bigger or the weeds to grow a little more, you do run the risk of maybe having some rains that push you back week after week. We're not gonna be in that situation and it is still early, but it can happen. Another noteworthy development is that the contractor for our new 48 foot grain bin has started delivering some gravel to start building. The bin's gonna go right in here, south of this pre-existing 48 foot bin. 
it's going to choke us up a little bit because we really don't have that much space here to begin with. I believe they'll go out there to level out the pad a little bit, put the gravel down, and then pour the concrete. I don't know how long the concrete sits and cures before the bin contractor shows up. They may be able to come almost immediately, but a lot of times I think that the timeliness of it is really just dependent on when the contractor gets freed and available to move on to their next build. In other not so noteworthy news, today is my 27th birthday. Yes, the big 2-7. I'm getting older and older every day. I have reached the stage in my life where I can confidently say I no longer have enough time in the day to get everything done that I'd like to get done. I know some of you probably deal with the same. Between full-time farming activities, which can be lengthy at times, spending time with the family, backing stuff on the YouTube videos, editing, working on emails, doing all the business stuff there, on top of just other activities, man, there's just not enough time to get everything done. Unfortunately, as I age, I also get less friendly with a lack of sleep. So I've been unable to cut into that time period too much. I did a few times this spring trying to get the crop in and sprayed early in April. I'm not gonna say that I enjoy doing that, but it is a necessary evil. There is one positive note to today. My uncles Chris and Jeff have managed to land me an inside job so I don't have to be out in the elements. Happy birthday, we're sleeping out of grain bin. To make this project even more enjoyable, these old bins to the west are not quite as luxurious as some of our newer bins here at the main farm. They do not have self-integrated power sweeps, meaning we have to manhandle a sweep into the bin to turn them on. And no, for the millionth time, we're not getting a vac. Relax. So what we're gonna do, we're just gonna have to deal with it. It also doesn't help that my partner in crime and lifting buddy, my dad, is pretty much out of commission for the entire summer. So I'm gonna have to handle this one on my own. This old sweep's been safe and sound for the protection of 4520 for the last six or seven months. Time to get her back out. Also probably need to think about getting our batwing mower hooked up. Some of the better farmers in the area have already started mowing roadsides, making us look bad. Hey there, I'll drive it. Power sweeps loaded up in the pickup. The last bin we emptied was 27 foot. We have to change a piece on the outside to get it wide enough for the 30 foot bins we're about to work on. So Chris is gonna run it over to the other side and we're gonna do that. The gear, just the center of it. Yeah. Yeah, 14 and a half foot. Well, that saved us a little bit of work. Yeah. If we change that. Yeah, we changed that real quick, didn't we, here, Chris? Everything I said remains true. Just disregard us having to change the length of the sweep. We normally empty our bins in the same order every year, so the sweep is in the same state when we finish. We usually finish on the 27 foot bins that are smaller, meaning that the sweep is set shorter. I guess we didn't do that last year, so we'll have to change it. On top of getting the bat wing hooked up and moved out, I also like to get these tires inside. They've got water sitting in the rim right now, probably not a huge deal. At the same time though, also not ideal. The neighbor's weed over this way just looks so majestic. Mark my words, one of these years here soon, we're gonna put some wheat in the ground. It looks like the out auger's still pumping out corn full speed, so I don't need to be in too much of a hurry. Wow, would you just look at this field of Don Mario 3756 Enlist Soybeans. We planted fairly early this season, which was especially ahead of schedule for this farm in particular. Man oh man, do those look good. Some of you may recall the second or third day of planting season, I was kind of kicking the idea around of whether or not we should be working this field wet and planting it. We went ahead and did exactly that. It looks like it turned out okay for us. Obviously from this point on, anything can happen. Major hailstorm, asteroid, locust invasion, you really never know. For now though, looks like we did the right thing. That's the funny thing about farming. You really never know when you're gonna be the hammer or the nail, and a lot of times you can't even make an evaluation which one of the two you are until long after the decision was made. Okay, Chris and Jeff are starting to bicker at each other. That means I probably ought to intervene. I'd say my presence is a bit premature. I don't think this is gonna quit this long. Essentially, I was just here for moral support at this point in time. It should quit on the next load. I may run back home for 30 minutes or so while Jeff runs the elevator, work on some other projects. Here comes another load of gravel for the bin. I don't know where this guy's hauling out of, but he's coming round trip pretty quick.
Technically, we could get the sweep in this top door hole. It doesn't take much more effort to scoop some of the corn down to the middle. That way we can loosen this door off and just give ourselves more room to work with. That's why I slithered my way in here. A little extra work that goes a long way to make your life easier. This bin's in a lot better shape than the bean bin we did the other day. Good 15% corn, nice and cool to the touch. part of the job is done. Just getting the sweep auger in the bin is pretty much the majority of the legwork. Unfortunately, it looks like Jeff's about full and the bin is not quit running completely. So I'm probably not gonna be able to get the sweep auger installed all the way today. There's a little hole in the center of the sump there that the sweep auger sits in. When there's too much corn running through, I can't line it up. So I've got it sitting here ready to be put in. Just not gonna be able to do it today, I don't think. Like I said, this corn is kind of dry, 14 to 15%. The drier the corn is, the more it'll flow down with gravity. So it'll keep working its way down the wall. It's pretty close to quitting. I just know that from historical experience, but it's not gonna quit this load. The ideal scenario is that you get the sweep in, turn it on and clear the corn out from the door. That way you can open the door all the way up and it's easy to get in and out on the next load. Doesn't look like that's gonna be the case here, so. I'll be here first thing in the morning working on this one. It just keeps flowing down. Those big pre-installed power sweeps at the main farm site are nice because you don't have to carry this sweep into every bit. They're already there, you just pull a lever out on the motor outside to engage them. This one, well, you gotta get it in the bin and you gotta provide power to it, as well as removing it from the bin and moving it to the next bit. Needless to say, it's a pretty eventful few days when we move over to this bin site to get all these empty. I can't complain too much. It's a solid 60 degrees in here, if not cooler. Nice and chilly because we've blown so much cold air through this corn that it's almost refrigerated in a sense. Now it is slowly picking up temperature because the ambient temperature outside is warming the corn up in the bin as it transfers through the walls. That's it for this one. I can happily say that I did just enough work to get dirty, smelly, sweaty, and have a little bit of corn in my shoes, but that does not take very much when you're inside of a grain bin. Before I take off for the day and let you guys off the hook for this video, I wanted to go full circle and talk a little bit more about the agronomics of side dressing. I had meant to talk about this much earlier in the video, but the hand I was dealt did not really coordinate well with getting this done. You never know what's going to pop up, so we can talk about it now. First off, look how much we've cleaned this place up. Most of our seed boxes are out of here. We've got some channel boxes and burrus boxes to go, though I'm not sure that we've even gotten hold of those dealers to pick them up. A few isn't really that distracting or in the way. It's the big DeKalb and Pioneer orders that take up the most space that you want out so you can actually do things. I wanted to talk briefly about side dressing nitrogen, what it is, and why we do it. Okay, class is in session. Cut me a bit of slack. I'm not an art major and I'm terrible at drawing, so this graphic is as good as it's gonna get. As I already mentioned, I just kind of wanted to highlight the agronomics of side dressing corn. Side dressing, like I showed you at the beginning of the video, is just applying nitrogen to your growing corn crop once it's emerged from the ground. It's just a catch-all phrase for any type of nitrogen application at that time. Other than maybe spreading urea on top, which is a granular product that'd be called top dressing. Side dressing is coming in and knifing in either a liquid nitrogen product or anhydrous ammonia. For the last four or five seasons, we've done a split shot of nitrogen, meaning we've broken up the bulk of our nitrogen application into two separate passes. We make use of fall NH3 or anhydrous. We put on about 50% of our effective target in the fall. With that anhydrous pass, we also put on some inserve, which is a nitrification inhibitor. That product basically slows down biological activity in the soil that converts non-leachable forms of nitrogen into leachable forms helping slow down any kind of environmental loss of nitrogen, hopefully getting it to our growing crop without losing a lot of it. That subject alone could be a five hour video, so I'm not gonna dive too much into it. 
Before I really dive into the weeds of this discussion, let's talk about how corn grows. Most of the time here in central Illinois, corn is going to be planted and emerged in early to mid-April. You have very small corn plant here. As we progress into May, June, the growth is exponential. Typically, the true sexual reproduction of corn is in late July to early August. That is where the bulk of the nitrogen is going to be consumed, as you can see from my top chart. The vegetative growth at the beginning does consume a very minor amount of nitrogen. This little blue line is representative of a percentage basis of nitrogen use by corn. The vegetative growth in the early season may use 5 to 10 percent. Once you hit June and that growth really becomes exponential, like I've said a million times, you start to really pick up a lot of that nitrogen. Once the corn has tasseled, it starts filling its ear, then you'll really start to ramp up the usage. Really by late August, maybe early September, a lot of times you've used a majority of your nitrogen that you're going to need for the year. And by October, you're gonna be harvesting your crop. The bulk of your nitrogen needs to be available for the plant by late June into early September. That is where the heart of your nitrogen usage comes in. I'm sure that this chart right here showing that the bulk of nitrogen is used in these two or three months makes this part much more confusing. Why do you put any kind of nitrogen on ahead of the crop, especially so far in advance? Typically, farmers apply nitrogen in the fall for two reasons, logistics and price. Historically, anhydrous ammonia is almost always the cheapest form of N that you can find. There are odd years here and there where that's not the case. And continuously in the fall, you're going to get the cheapest prices. A lot of farmers in my neck of the woods and north believe that the cold winter temperatures from mid-November into February, even early March, slow down enough of this biological activity that you actually don't lose very much anhydrous ammonia, ammonium, and all the other products to those natural causes. There was a long period of time where our operation actually applied 100% of our anhydrous ammonia in the fall. It's cheap, it's easy, and really it is the simplest way to put your nitrogen on. What we've seen in the last five to 10 years as big rainfalls have started to hit us earlier and more often is that those events have caused significant reductions in our quantity of nitrogen in the soil. If we were starting at 100% here in November and we get a huge rain in March, sometimes you could estimate that you're losing 20% from a four or five inch rain, especially if the ground stays saturated for a long time. You get another big one in June when it's even warmer outside. Well, there goes another 10 or 20% there. Those are very loose numbers, but you get the point. Then the crop starts to take up the rest in July and August, and you run the risk in this time period of losing enough nitrogen in the beginning of the season that you don't have enough to completely fill out your crop and maximize yield. That is where the side dressing comes in. I should also note that the other fix would be just to apply your anhydrous ammonia in late March or April. A lot of farmers share a similar mindset to our own, where if it's dry enough in late March or early April to be putting on anhydrous six inches in the ground, you probably should be working your ground and planting it anyways. The other issue is that anhydrous is so potent that there is a plant back delay ahead of the corn. Usually it's just five, six days maybe, depending on temperatures, depth of application, and the potency of the product you apply, or the total nitrogen you put on. Although corn loves nitrogen, Corn seedlings in seeds do not enjoy hitting a very potent band of anhydrous ammonia in the soil that is not dispersed out, and you can actually get some toxicity and have poor emergence because of that. That is what rules out 100% spring ammonia for our operation. We don't like the compaction. There's a lot of guys down south that are very big on that. I can see logistically why you would do that. We just personally would rather be planting as opposed to messing around with that. Obviously, you have side dressing opportunities. You can use anhydrous or 32% as well as top dressing with urea if you want in May, June, or July. That entirely depends on what kind of application equipment and tolerance to running over corn you have personally. I know that logically many of you are thinking, well, why put it on so far in advance or even ahead at all if you can just put it on right when the crop needs it? In a perfect world, yes, that's all you would do. You'd plant your crop, you'd come in immediately, you'd put on your full rate of nitrogen and be off to the races without worry. Again, this comes back into logistical concerns, specifically in the April, May, and even early June timeframe. If you continuously get rainfalls, which is not unlikely, there is a risk that you don't get back into your corn until it's too tall to side dress. Usually by mid to late June, it's too tall to get anything in it other than a top dress urea rig. 
That is why a lot of farmers like us like to have some source of nitrogen in the ground going into the season. We may lose a marginal amount of it over the winter, but at the same time, we know that even if we can't get in there till late June or July, the corn has nitrogen to take up. In June, like I said, it could be using 5, 10, 15 percent. And as long as we know half of our nitrogen or even just a fraction of our nitrogen is in the ground, we don't necessarily have to be as concerned about getting it on in a timely fashion. On that same note, there is also a very small camp of people who think that even corn seedlings need a good hit of nitrogen to have a good start to their life and to quickly vegetate. I'm not totally sold on that idea. We have a few farms where we're spraying on some 32% nitrogen as a poor man's starter. That corn definitely looks greener. That does not mean though that financially at the end of the day, it's going to result in any more yield or money in our pocket. Ultimately, you lead to the exact approach we use. I know there's many ways to skin this cat. I'm not saying what we do is perfect, but you can come in in late May or early June and side dress your corn with whatever form you want and end up putting in the rest of the nitrogen you need for your growing crop. You've not taken the risk on the entire portfolio of nitrogen overwintering without losses or leaching. You know that you've got another good shot. This should be enough to ensure that regardless of what kind of growing season you've had or continue to have, if it's wet, you have plenty of nitrogen to feed your crop to the finish line and ensure that you have good test weights and final yields. A farmer's nitrogen practices are always going to be a combination of prices, logistics and personal preference. That's what it comes down to. Everyone holds the keys to their own kingdom on their farm, so to speak, and they'll kind of decide to do with nitrogen what they think is perfect. There is really no silver bullet for managing nitrogen. Some people put starter systems on their planter to put nitrogen right under the seed and then come back and side dress. Some people pull an anhydrous bar in late March, put 100% of their nitrogen on and are done with it. Other people, especially as you go north, put 100% on in the fall with anhydrous. Some people come in and side dress with 100% in late June. Some farmers have high clearance sprayers that they can put wide drops on and side dress a large chunk of their nitrogen in July. There's really a million different ways to approach nitrogen management. Unfortunately, I will say that farmers as a whole, including us, have a lot of room for improvement when it comes to fertility management. We see a lot of downstream effects from nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium leaching out into our waterways, into our rivers, and out into the ocean, causing the hypoxic zone. The sour reality of it all is that if we as a whole do not improve our practices, we probably will eventually not have a choice how we apply our nitrogen. It will be regulated by the government. That's just kind of the way we're going, especially as the EPA reveals the next round of results of leaching data and all the stuff they're seeing coming out of the watersheds. It's really a self-perpetuating cycle and we are just as bad as everyone else. Farmers are shooting for higher yield goals every year. They're putting on more nitrogen and other fertilizers. They're installing more drainage systems on their farm. And at the end of the day, more and more of that excess product does find its way into those watersheds and ultimately down to the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know what the perfect solution to that is. The problem you run into with nitrogen is that a lot of farmers are not willing to risk running out of nitrogen on their corn crop. They'd rather have too much out there than cut it short knowing what the optimal quantity is. Every year is so different that it's even hard to model exactly how much nitrogen you need because if you have a warm and wet spring, you're going to lose more nitrogen to the environment. If you have a dry spring, well, you may not lose as much. If you have poor growing conditions, your crop may not need as much nitrogen because it's not going to have the high yield potentials. It's just such a moving target that it's hard for farmers to safely say, I need to put X amount on because this is what I'm dealing with. Every field is so different in its own right. The situation is dynamic. The next decade or two will be very interesting as we see how all this research continues to pan out because I do personally agree that maybe farmers need to manage their nitrogen a little bit better. I hope this visualization and discussion helped clarify a few things for you. Sometimes it's very hard to discuss some of these topics because I have to try and be as formal as possible to explain them to you in a way that a layman would understand them. 
At the same time, I also still manage to use a lot of slang, like calling 32% liquid nitrogen 32. Most of you who are not familiar with corn farming probably think I'm talking about taking a seat at the roulette table, and in many ways, farming is just like that. This was a very base level and all over the place unorganized discussion of corn nitrogen management. Really, you need someone much more qualified than myself, and the topic could be discussed for days on end. Herein lies the complicated part of being both a channel for education on farming and entertainment. It's hard to kind of hybridize those two things because a lot of this discussion is not the most exciting. I will round it out by giving you guys some random side dressing clips that I caught the other day while Helena was running 32 for us. Yeah, I know, cut me some slack. This video is just all over the place. Anyways, that's gonna be it for me finally. This video is coming to an end. As always, I greatly appreciate every single one of you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you wanna see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace!